Grace and Jonah. Failing to address the root of the problem has left the United States with hundreds of thousands of drug offenders stuck in an endless cycle of addiction that our criminal justice system has been unable to solve for many years. If, ever, if America is ever to keep its drug habit, we must find an alternative to incarceration for drug offenders. So consequently, the affirmative team affirms that the United States federal government should significantly reform its criminal justice system. Now today, the affirmative team will be proposing what we call a weighing mechanism. And this is that of net benefits. So in other words, if the affirmative team can prove that the benefits of our plan outweigh the potential drawbacks, then we believe an affirmative ballot is warranted. Now, let's move on. Uh, before we move on to our policy change, I'd like to offer a definition. And this first definition today is drug courts. Today, the affirmative team is, support, is in support of this program. The National Criminal Justice Reference Service stated in 2011 that drug courts can be defined as special court calendars or dockets designed to achieve a reduction in recidivism and substance abuse among nonviolent substance abusing offenders by increasing their likelihood for successful rehabilitation through early, intense, judicially supervised treatment mandatory periodic drug testing, and the use of appropriate sanctions and rehabilitation services. The same source later went on to say that drug courts share three primary goals. First, to reduce recidivism. Second, to reduce substance abuse. And three, to rehabilitate participants. So to summarize, drug courts are essentially an alternative to prison. Nonviolent drug offenders who would be sent to prison in the status quo go through rehabilitation programs. Now that we have a clear understanding of what these courts do, let's take a look at what's going on in the status quo in our next observation of inherency. The reality is that our country has a massive drug problem that our government has been unable to solve for many years. This program has become so widespread in our system that over 50% of criminals are drug offenders. Even worse, these offenders are stuck in an endless cycle of high recidivism and addiction. The encouraging thing, though, is that our government has a program to battle this issue, but unfortunately, they are yet to take full advantage of it. What we see is that in the current system, 1.2 million people are eligible for drug courts, but are unable to gain access because one is not available. United States Congressman Michael Honda affirmed in 2011 that drug courts focus on high-value offenders, those who have the highest need for treatment and wraparound services, and those who have the highest risk of failing out of the system without support and structure. These are individuals who drain our resources and perpetuate general crime and substance abuse. Drug courts serve more than 120,000 such individuals per year, but of this, this is only 10% of the eligible offender population. The Department of Justice recently identified 1.2 million individuals who would be eligible for drug courts, but are unable to gain access because one is not available to them. Now, in light of the reality that millions of drug offenders cannot be treated properly, we propose the following plan. We have two mandates. Our first mandate today is that capacity will be increased to allow all current federal eligible drug offenders to be diverted into drug courts. Our second mandate is that current grants to states will be increased to provide states with the capacity to divert their eligible offenders into drug courts. Our funding today, what we see is that our plan actually saves billions of dollars, and details, details will be brought up later on in this speech. Next is our enforcement, the United States Department of Justice and the federal court system. Now, the affirming team reserves the right to clarify our plan in future speeches. Upon passing of our plan, we gain three significant advantages. The first advantage today is a reduction in recidivism. Over the years, numerous studies have been conducted on this issue. And although the results differ slightly, the evidence clearly shows that drug courts reduce recidivism, that some, uh, reduce recidivism and reduce the chances that somebody will be a repeat offender. Dr. Douglas Marlowe, Ph.D., and an adjunct associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and a former director of the Division of Law and Ethics at the Treatment Research Institute, summarized all these studies in 2010, when he said that more research has been published on the effects of adult drug courts than virtually any criminal justice system program combined. By 2006, the scientific community had concluded beyond reasonable doubt from advanced statistical procedures called meta-analysis that drug courts reduce recidivism. The results of five independent meta-analysis revealed that drug courts significantly reduced rearrest and reconviction rates by approximately 8 to 26 percent, with the averages of averages reflecting 10 to 15 percent, end quote. Now, these numbers of success directly affect all of us in the debate room today in one area. What we see is that rehabilitation, when it increases, also does public safety. The National Institute on Drug Abuse in 2011 stated that when left untreated, Drug abusing offenders can relapse into drug use and return to criminal behavior. This jeopardizes public health and public safety and also leads to rearrest and reincarceration and further taxes on an already overburdened criminal justice system. End quote. In many ways, um, or excuse me, in addition, making society safer, drug courts also help those who are rehabilitated in many ways. This brings me to our second advantage today changed lives. 
Jamie Houston, the Baltimore judge, reported in the Baltimore Sun in 2011 that, quote, participants enter drug courts with their spirits broken, having lost everything, a home, a job, a family, self-respect, and health. But at graduation, they are drug-free, having rebuilt lost lives and regained a sense of self-worth. Most enter unemployed and leave gainfully employed. They begin drug courts consumed with feeding their addictions and end it nourishing their children and families, end quote. Likewise, Robert Long, the community editor for the Soto Times Tribune in 2011, titled an article, Drug Courts Changing Lives. He said that Circuit Judge Robert P. Chamberlain said he has witnessed lives being changed due to the drug court program. We feel that statistics aside, what we see is that drug courts graduates become productive, tax-paying American citizens, which is awfully a long way from where we got them in the first place. We feel that it's changed people's lives from being one in which they were drug addicts and living into a life of living a clean life and taking care of their families. Now, reduced recidivism, safer streets, and changed lives are worth almost any monetary cost. And this brings me to our third advantage, and the most intriguing part of our plan. What we see is that we are actually cutting costs. So that's advantage three, cost cuts. According to most estimates, the functions that our plan will be re replacing, which is mostly incarceration, cost the government about $40 billion per year. Now, in contrast, what we see is that our plan costs approximately 13 but when we do the math, we see that this is a saving of $27 billion annually. The estimate is typical of most studies, and John K. Roman, the senior research associate at the Justice Policy Center and the Urban Institute, backed this study up in July 2010, when he said that a 2008 Urban Institute study examined whether expanding drug courts to more drug-involved offenders is cost-beneficial. Expanding drug courts to all 1.2 million drug-involved offenders would be expensive with a price tag exceeding $13 billion, but would return more than $40 billion in benefits annually." End quote. So if a policy assists in the seemingly endless cycle of addiction and recidivism, saves American taxpayers money, and changes lives, then it only makes sense that we expand it. Our plan reduces crime, saves money, and changes society. For all these reasons, I would strongly urge you to vote affirmative. Thank you, my national bank, for cross presentation.
Um, now, can you give me a specific number on recidivism in the, the drug courts, specifically in the federal system? Is, do you have a number on recidivism going down there? Sure, 8 to 26 percent. Okay. I mean, there have been plenty of studies, and they give different estimates, but that's, different. that's typically the range, 8 to 26 percent. Okay. Now, what is the completion rate for the drug court programs that have been in place? How many? Uh, 70 percent. 70 percent completed. Okay. And what's the penalty for not completing the program? It's exactly what would happen in the status quo. They just go back to prison. They go back to prison. Okay. Do they have to repeat their entire sentence, or do they go back to the, the in the middle of their sentence? Um, what is it? What I'm is sure it can vary. It can